All right, Sylvie, thank you for coming and hanging out with me today and doing some drawings and stuff together. Um, why don't you tell me, I understand you want to work through uh, the ending of a short story for horror and you want something that's unique. So tell me a little bit about this story and show me what you know so far and what you're, where you're tempted to go with the story and we can work through it from there. Okay, sure. So I heard about a an opportunity to pitch to Weird Tales magazine for Jonathan Mayberry, okay. and I got very excited because whether I'm writing horror or dark fantasy, I just like all things dark, and I do like things cosmic. And I'm a big fan of Robert Chambers, so I had this idea that Rome is alive and that it feeds on the souls of those who come there, but not all of the souls, only some of them, the ones that are that it wants. Okay, and, and Rome, so, who is Rome? Rome. Rome, Rome, Rome the city. Okay. The city of Rome. The city of Rome, Rome is, is alive. alive. Rome okay. is alive and Rome is a monster and all the great cities are monsters. Okay. okay. So uh, two uh, young people have come to visit Rome and one of them is sucked into a trap uh, and Rome is going to destroy that young person. Okay. So when her best friend comes to find her, the current ending that I have is that the best friend is running to her, it's at midnight, uh, the Colosseum is, is lit with the uh, incredible lights they have at night there, mm -hmm. and the um, friend is running forward, she reaches out, and when she does, her hand is kind of absorbed into her friend. Mm -hmm. And that's a very Robert Chambers horror kind of okay. ending. So I probably shouldn't spoil the ending, but anyway, <laughs> but the problem is I've seen that. I've okay. seen that where a person's, you know, flesh, you know, uh, absorbs somebody else and things like that. Conjoined. And I thought, okay, conjoined, yes. Okay. Um, so I thought, what is going to make it bigger, mm -hmm. bigger, biggest? What's going to make it unique? Okay. And that's the problem I'd like to work on. Okay, cool. Um, uh, what are the stakes for the individual characters? Um, death. Death is the stake for the best friend, so loss of the love of the friend and loss of the friend. And also living with the horror of, um, of what she's just seen. So it's probably easier if I use names. So Del is uh, the friend who is not absorbed and Emily is the one who is. Okay. And so the stakes for Del are that she sees her friend die, realizes that something horrifying has happened and goes forward in life with the understanding that this horrifying, um, type of death and absorption exists. Right. And if I am, you know, I'm, I'm still playing with it because <laughs> the story's not written. Okay. So I pitched it, but it's an idea. It's not a finished written story. Okay. Um, do these two characters have anything else going on in their lives at the time that this encounter with Rome interrupts it? Yes, they've come to Rome to see the world before they go back to their um, hometowns. So Amy Lee is a veterinarian, and uh, Dell is all, or not a very veterinarian, sorry, a veterinary um, assistant. Okay. And um, I'm not really sure what, what Dell is doing. So Amy Lee is a veterinary assistant. Okay. And they're there to see the world before they, I guess, get started with the business of being adults. Okay. okay. So I'd say they're probably around age. It's not right out of high school. So 21, something like that. Okay. Maybe 20, 21 years old. Okay. So they're in their 20s, pre-serious pre adulting. Yes. Um, Best friends, very close, love each other dearly, trust okay. each other completely. And it sounds like one of them knows what they're going to do and the others may be figuring it out. Either that or I am figuring it out as the author. Okay. And maybe Dell knows exactly what she wants to do. Okay. Um, so my first thought is that um, I've been doing research into minimum viable stories. And I have, what I understand so far is that every story, every scene, every character needs three things, just three layers. And if a story is falling short, it's because it's missing one of okay. these three. Um, and these three layers inform where you go with your climax. So the three layers are, um, you have your uh, like a goof off layer. It's also known as the big wow. And it just means there's, there is something thematic about the story where you are just telling yourself the silliest, funniest, sparkly, or most horrifying, like whatever it is about a story that makes it super fun for you. Okay. You have a wow layer that's just goofing off. 
The second thing you need is called a verisimilitude layer, and this comes from Aristotle. So Aristotle talked about how, so veris means truth, and similitude is something reflecting things in real life. So in a story, your audience needs to be able to relate to what's going on in the story and resonate it with it on a personal level okay. in some way. Um, and it's usually not just uh, keeping up with appearances. You have to connect with people in in a way where... I'm trying to think of a good example. It's like... So a verisimilitude layer I did in a story recently was... Um, it was for a character, and it was a no-trespassing sort of hermit who just like wants to keep everybody at bay. And it was silly, but it, it, there's also something about it that's relatable. It's, mm -hmm. it's wanting to keep people at bay and finding details that people can relate to of how we shut other people out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what verisimilitude means. Um, and if you ever want to look more into that, my favorite example of it is uh, Miyazaki from Studio Ghibli. He's a master of verisimilitude details. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you need is your target experience, your target message, your story thesis. Mm -hmm. So that is the reason you are writing a story is because you have something you care deeply about that you want to talk about. Um, and you have a really good bones for story, and I want to ask you, what are your three layers for this story? <sighs> okay, <clears throat> so unprepared. So, <clears throat> okay, I'm smiling because I'm thinking about this. Um, maybe I should just put out the different layers and you can tell me if you recognize them. Okay. So there is a painter who is also the procurer of souls for the city of Rome. And so okay. the painter um, is painting, he's a street painter. And he is fascinated by Amy Lee whenever she reaches up and she, um, uh, oh no, there's a, a fly on her cheek and she doesn't brush it away because she's so... Uh, kind to animals that she would not even touch a fly that's <laughs> okay. on her cheek. Okay. And so for me, it's this, it's kind of horror element, but the painter notices and he offers to paint her and he uh, appeals to her vanity. Okay. And so Amy Lee at first says no, because he has some physical characteristics that she finds appalling. He's okay. unattractive in the extreme. Okay. And so she says no. And so then they run into the painter later at um, almost midnight in Rome mm -hmm. and he, uh, she, oh, Amy Lee, feels embarrassed that she has been repulsed. And so not only is she drawn in by her, um, by his appeal to vanity, because he's a very great painter, and she can see that the colors seem to be moving and seem to be alive mm. in his paintings. So she says, she starts to think, and she's arguing with Dell, who's saying, leave this guy alone. But she's arguing and saying, but, you know, what he's doing is something special. Mm -hmm. And so she becomes more, not only fascinated with the idea that she could be painted, but also she's ashamed that she is taking his looks and rejecting him. So she says, I need to talk to him again to kind of prove that she's not so vain or prove that she's not shallow. And okay. so she, they argue and then, um, and so Dell says, you know, don't go back to see this person. But in the night, Amy Lee slips out of their hotel room and she goes to see this painter to see if he's still there at the Colosseum. And so after she disappears, then uh, Dell realizes when she, you know, sees Amy Lee is gone, she thinks, I think I know where she's gone. Of course, I'll build that all up. Yeah. And then runs to go find her and then finds her in this state of having been drained and absorbed in some very odd way, which is still okay. in process and thus my thinking about an ending but she's there at the Colosseum and above um ah, you know I don't <laughs> I've got all these different <laughs> details but she is no longer herself in some way she has been lost so hmm. it is for me what what draws me is this combination of vanity because she sees how the painter uses color and is appealing to her and shame that she has been rejecting toward him because of his appearance. Okay. Um, and let me ask you, as far as your real world values go, um, I'm curious whether you fall on the side of wanting this to be cautionary of like, it's okay to listen to your inner instincts and like, is this a story about 
trust and instinctive self-care or is it a story about um encouraging yourself to be like more open it sounds like it's more of a cautionary tale it's meant to be a cosmic horror and i'm working on the cosmic part of it okay. and there that has to come in the writing there's no way i can explain it today mm -hmm. very well okay. but since it's horror the idea is that because You've got cautionary with the vanity, but also there's cautionary with guilt. Okay, so I haven't <laughs> okay. put this into words before, but when you use that guilt to overcome the better judgment of yourself and the better judgment of your closest friend, then you can be pulled in, and sometimes it's two things. So here it's the vanity and the guilt. Like, I am not shallow. I am not rejecting this person. Okay. And so, yeah. So it sounds like... The layers that I'm seeing, vanity feels like the verisimilitude, and guilt feels seems like the more important like tipping point mm. um, that that breaks her instinctive conscious for self protection. Um, so, yes. so I would presume yes. that vanity is the verisimilitude layer, and the, that um, cautionary about listening too hard to your guilt is your thesis. Yes. Um, so what's your goof off layer? That when Del reaches out to grab her at the end, her hand is absorbed into her friend's, uh, say flesh because it's cosmic horror, <laughs> absorbed in, you know, she reaches out and her fingers sink in okay. uh, because she has been transformed in a horrifying way okay. and then probably gets liquefied. But that's why, I, I mean melts, melts into the ground. But that's the piece I say, okay, have I seen this before? Have I read this in Chambers? Mm -hmm. Have I seen this in Lovecraft? You know, the, the hand that goes in. It's like, okay, I like resonance, but I don't want it to be something where people say, oh, well, you know, I kind of have seen this before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like it, it appeals to something primal in us, but it doesn't necessarily make me say, wow. Okay. So I think, let's see if we can can replace that or toy with that ending a little bit. Um, I'm specifically gonna look for it in a way that is thematic, where you can layer that wow and that fun in as a repeating theme throughout the story. There are lots of ways that you can expound on it throughout mm, the whole okay. short story. Because um, that's what makes a good climax is you build up to it. Um, and there are, there are iterations, variations of it. Um, so one more question for you. Um, why does Rome want these souls? Rome is a sleeping entity. And it will die if it does not absorb a certain amount of the right kind of soul. So not every soul in Rome, but the <laughs> procurer of Rome is the painter of Rome. It's looking for fine souls. It has to be a certain type, a certain type of quality. Okay. And the fact that she would not even brush away a fly on her cheek was unique. And part something about Amy Lee different from others. Ooh. Something that would be really interesting, actually, in contrast then with her best friend, is if you use her best friend to emphasize everything that is mediocre and boring about the average person and makes them unfit for procurement. So to embody it or to point it out? Embody it. I think that would be super Poor fun. Poor Okay. <laughs> Poor Adele. Um, of which the fact that she doesn't know what she wants to do with her life is probably a okay. key beginning. And like maybe that's the friend that wants to go see all the tourist places and like, you know, just try the food, try the junk food or like not into the cultural food of the era, just looking, looking for the McDonald's around. Like, oh. I don't know how you want to play with that, but I think that would be an awesome theme for that character. Uh, okay. And I can think about that. And I almost thought of Amy Lee as having that as another part of herself, that she's simultaneously shallow on one group of levels and elevated in another. And that Dell is that voice of, you need to protect yourself, that needs to be repeated over mm -hmm. and over. Yeah. Don't give in to vanity, don't give in to guilt, don't allow yourself to do something by following those, almost like, I wanted to say like a Greek chorus, mm -hmm. but you know, just warning, 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 and that Amy Lee would be embodying those two separate things. Because I, I don't want a unidimensional Amy Lee, yeah. you know, too shiny. I don't like too shiny. Mm -hmm. 
Um, okay. Um, well, so one thing that stands out to me about Rome, Rome is a monster. Monsters always need a purpose. Um, in, in, a, in a good story, a monster um, has fallen out of balance with its environment, usually has a strong relationship with the habitat it's in, and mm -hmm. has a key purpose there. And when that relationship falls out of balance, then they turn into a monster. So I'm curious. Um, uh, I'm curious what Rome's duty is when Rome is in balance. And for that, I want to draw a character. <sighs> okay. What do you got? I have got Ooh. Chef. Someone who takes a necessity of life and makes it pleasurable. Okay. I like that. What stands out about that to you? What are your first thoughts? Well, since I'm thinking about feeding Rome in some way, then the fact that I drew a card that says chef freaks me out a little bit. Um, and also, first of all, I've been to Rome. I love Rome. I, I thought I loved other cities, but when I came in, I felt that it was alive. So I'm twisting it so that it's alive in a bad way. But I felt that Rome was alive. So the fact that it's pleasurable, okay, a necessity of life and makes it pleasurable. So eating and breathing and walking with fellow man and being in lovely places that feel good to the eye and feel good to the heart, all those things are pleasurable. So if a city had a soul and if it was alive, then it might have the purpose, if it's not an evil monster, it might have the purpose of nurturing and feeding those within it. And so if it was a monster, it might be twisted so that instead of feeding those within, it's consuming those within. Or some of them, not all of them. Okay. I want to know why. Tell so me, ask me more. That, <laughs> okay. For that, um, I feel like you don't know the answer to that. Right. Am I reading? So, right. This is a pitch. This is not a written so story. So yeah. we're going to reach for a trait. Okay. Um, traits can be very specific, and so it's possible the first card we reach for isn't going to be a good fit okay. for the story. If it's not, we'll draw two more, and you can pick the best of three. Okay. Sound good? So start with one. Okay, and ask me the question again. The question is... So the question is, why does Rome fall out of balance? This is Rome's purpose, Okay. and that's good up to a point, and we want to know what breaks Rome. Okay. So this is a trait. Something changes about Rome. Depleted. Drained of its primary value in a way that is difficult to replenish. All right. Are these magic cards? I don't know. <laughs> okay. That seems like it does fit. Um, Drained and depleted. So maybe the city is in a place where maybe the city is used to greatness and as the city is decaying and falling apart, mm. it creates the city's equivalent of starvation. Okay, I love it. It also takes me back to the first card and also to some underlying ideas of, um, do you know what a tulpa is? Mm -mm. Oh, if I remember it correctly, and I'm not sure, um, a tulpa is a magical thing that comes alive or comes into being because of belief. And mm -hmm. so it comes in certain cultures. I cannot explain off the top of my head which ones, but a tulpa is a great reason for Rome to be alive. If enough people believe that cities have a life and cities exist, then cities will have a life and they will exist. And that's that principle of being a tulpa. And so if Rome came to life as a center of, um, a center of spiritual belief and sacrifice, uh, heroics and conquering and being greatest among the great in all the world and became a tourist trap, then I imagine it would be depleted. So here's something fascinating about Rome. You may already know this. Do you know who built Rome? 
who actually built Rome? And my answer is no. It was not the Romans as we know them in history. The Romans that we know in history who lived there and and were the like gladiators and the conquerors um, were actually invaders that took over the city of Rome. No, I had no idea. So the city of Rome, (laughs) the city of Rome was originally built by a culture called the Etruscans. Oh, okay. okay. And the Etruscans were the one who invented Latin. The Etruscans were descended from Greece. Love it. So they left Greece, traveled down to Italy, built Rome, and then other people came and took the city over from them, stole their language, stole their religion, uh, and stole everything that was good about the city and twisted it into what they wanted and made it a capital of conquering and bloodshed Mm. for the next several hundred years. So... That's something really fascinating that you should probably know about Rome if you're writing this short story. Um, And that might be, like, the beginning of this city going a little bit crazy. I would look into the history, too, of, like, when did the gladiatorial uh, gladiatorial fights start in the Colosseum? And did the Colosseum have a pre-existing purpose? Um, I'm guessing that when the city was taken over, you had a lot of artists that were enslaved until they died, and then a bunch of people who just lived in the city. Um, and and uh, so it would have gone from being an artist's city and a spiritual city to being a city of just powerful people and warlords. So you've taken this from short story to novel now. <laughs> so And that's fine, because I think that can really be done. Mm-hmm. And since I'm primarily a novelist, um, that would be absolutely amazing. Yeah, so so consider that. Okay. And th- those are details that you can throw in there um, as a quick hook, even, right at the beginning of a short story. So you mm. could keep that in, in short story territory, um, just maybe as your two characters are going on tours through the city, that would be a really interesting initial detail to throw in there. <sighs> Excellent. Um, I would definitely consider what textures are associated with hunger and I would I would emphasize hunger in this city in every way you can think of and when you say textures can you explain what you mean by textures that emphasize or represent I'm looking for I would recommend you you layer in the visual evidence of hunger and this can be everything from malnutrition thinner hair broken fingernails yellow eyes that reminds me of robert chambers detail so yeah Mm -hmm. when he writes wrote um that's the kind of detail he would have had Mm -hmm. so absolutely Mm -hmm. and if you play that right that can even be a goof off detail Mm -hmm. that's a good fun angle to like take from your horror and it gives you some tactile elements too when you have your character who's being absorbed into the city ideally that climax isn't just about the disintegration of their body ideally that's also a reveal moment where the this person this character comes to understand what it is that's really going on with Rome and why Rome is the way it is and when it be when they begin to be absorbed by the city excellent there should be some emotional exchange where it's an aha moment of like oh my god I understand and I have empathy for the city that is starving to death Mm -hmm. so you can make that super tactile love it love it um Do you have any other questions about this story, or does that sort of fill in the holes? Do you do you want to to explore a different ending for your character? Okay, I would. I may stay with something similar or play with my own ideas further, Mm -hmm. but if there's a way to look at that exact moment of Dell seeing Amy Lee, and I can play with hunger and details you've just given me but if there's something different that could happen to the body of the friend there needs to be something physical that happens to Amy Lee that can be seen heard felt smelled and that takes the reader by the throat 
<laughs> that's what I want. Takes the reader by the throat and they go, ah, I don't that's know how dark you want to go with this. Well, I'm looking at cosmic horror. Okay. So yes, this the would first not be thing that comes to mind is cannibalism. Okay. Hunger. You got the painter. Okay. And maybe the first time you see the painter, he is like selling yakitori sticks or something like, I don't know, like, like, like barbecue meat or something, uh, which you can just take for granted the first okay. time you're, you're going through. But you, if you, if you have a city that's hungry, like you could do like the melty melty thing, or you could literally have the city eat the body or have the painter who represents the city eat the body. So it's super dark. Okay. We can I have explore to like right, medium, right, right, medium right. tone too. But two. cannibalism. But cannibalism is one option. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. I feel like I want to draw an element. I feel, because with the melting and stuff, we're looking for some sort of tactile, relatable, like, way to twist this body. Mm. Um, and I, I feel like an element is going to give us an interesting, an interesting angle on that. So draw an element. Cloth. Necessity that also becomes a necessary. Lack of clothes is associated with psychosis. It's right up my alley. I love it. Symbolizes fluency, navigating the feelings, needs, and motivations of other people. Hmm. What comes to mind to you? I had Amy Lee go out in her nightgown. I'm not sure of the time of year and how that's going to impact the story, but that she goes out and already in my mind, she was not clothed the way you would need to be to hike from your hotel room to the Coliseum, <laughs> which I have walked from my hotel room to the Coliseum in the night. Sure. I have a little bit of an understanding of that, but I was not in a nightgown. Um, symbolizes fluency navigating feelings, needs, and motivations of others. Motivations. Interesting. So thematically, you have a character who is hemming and hawing over her needs versus others. And it sounds like right. there's there's a difficulty navigating that, like, and, and deciding in the end what the motivations of other people are and how she should respond to that. She is unconscious. I'm not sure if she's unconscious about Dell's motivations because this is so in process. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the painter-procurer, she sees someone who is unlovely that she has rejected and does not consider that this unlovely person is predatory. Mm -hmm. And so she's really missing, missing what a predatory person does, that a predatory person creates something beautiful to draw you in mm -hmm. and then tries to draw you in. And she's going, she, she's almost falling for it. I mean, she's seeing something beautiful. Um, so there are two thoughts that I have in addition to that. Um, what, the first thing that I thought of when I saw this card was I'm giving the shirt off the back. And so you have like that, this is her trying to be ge generous yes. toward humanity. Yes. She's trying to be a good person and open her heart. She's up. judging herself for not being She's open. judging herself for not being open. So this may not just be like your average, like beautiful painter. This may be some sort of interesting combination of a painter and a beggar. And and maybe Could you be. see maybe you see iterations of the personification of the city. Um, and, and, and multiple temptations along the way. So you have the painter, which mm -hmm. is an appeal to vanity. You could also have a beggar, which is an appeal to, um, philanthropy. And maybe there's a third one in there somewhere. A separate beggar or have the procurer be both a painter and a beggar? I don't know how TBD. you to TBD. TBD. Um, and, and you could even have the characters be like, you know, maybe thinking like, oh, that looks like that other guy we saw earlier and just dismiss and, and her friend could call her out as being racist. 
Like, you're so racist, like, they look different, like, you're just not paying attention. Um, there's lots of ways to layer in that guilt. Um, whereas one person is seeing, like, warning signs and the other person is, like, trying to dismiss it right away. Um, so... Wow. The other thing mm. that I think of when I see this is cloth is beautiful. And cloth is one of those texture details that elevates quickly from one class to another. Okay. So maybe what's happening with this body of her friend isn't necessarily something instantly horrific and destructive, but where the city absorbs the body and immediately makes use of it in a way that makes the city more beautiful. Oh, okay. And again, that's a layer that you can work into other beautiful things you've seen in the city. Of course, there are statues. There are always statues. Mm -hmm. There are always, there's always that beauty. Mm -hmm. And in other places, other than the, okay, mm, having thoughts. <laughs> Thought, ping, ping, ping. And you okay. can layer those details of beauty right alongside, like, tourist missing posters. Mm. So things to consider. Um, would you like to draw one more texture? Yes, let's just do as it. A, as a challenge to play with again. And, and explain just uh, uh, about texture. What does texture mean again? It means... Okay, so textures change the way... Actually, this is really perfect. Che textures change the way someone interacts with something. So if something is fuzzy, what do you want to do with it? You want to touch it, right? Which can lead to violated boundaries. If something is made of rust and razor wire, you stay way away. Right. So textures are one of our first cues about how we're supposed to interact with something. Um, and it's actually a companion deck with traits. Okay. Because traits are energy the other way around. It changes how we interact with our, the world. So traits are the outward energy and textures are the inward energy. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's uh, just draw a random texture, and this is going to be, normally I have people like pick a question, but this we have a lot of interesting pieces, and so I think we're just going to draw a random card and see where it fits. Okay. Hot. Cutting edge, popular, or dangerous to be caught with. Cutting edge, popular, or dangerous to be caught with. And also I'm looking at the image. What, what, a, is it a book that's glowing? Mm hmm Okay. So that book has a pentagram on it. Um, it's sort of a play on words. Um, cause something can be, something can be both hot, popular and dangerous. And, uh, pentagram like dark witchcraft books are one of those categories of books that has traditionally over the course of mankind been super dangerous to be caught with. Um, so that's kind of what the picture is. It, okay. It's sort of like a haunted, like, supernatural book. What's coming to mind for me is the Colosseum itself. So okay. in my mind, I thought of it as the maw, the place where something is taken in. And so if that's both popular, in fact, I was going to have a nighttime tour, which was going to play into mm -hmm. part of what was going on in the story, TBD. So there was going to be a nighttime tour, so there were going to be other people around. Um, but the fact that it's popular and dangerous fits that. But here's the problem I have with it. It fits that. I don't want mm -hmm. it to fit that. I want something that takes my mind in some other direction that it hasn't already gone. Okay. Cool. So this is where drawing cards with a friend is super helpful because other people are going to have different takes on the same card that you might not have thought of. Okay. Um, what I think of with regards to your story, when I think of hot, I think of stolen art that's okay. super dangerous to be caught with. I think of people carrying drugs in foreign countries, which is also super dangerous to be caught with because international laws for drugs are very different and not as always not always as forgiving as they are in your home country. Um, also thinking of uh, money burning a hole in your pocket, that's hot. Um, which also makes me think mm. of uh, people flaunting their wealth and being uh, vulnerable to pickpockets. 
Mm. Um, lots of different ways you can take that. Um, and when you mentioned the Colosseum with regards to this, it also made me think of like underground fighting rings. So maybe even though the, the Colosseum isn't like live anymore, I could see some temptation for other people to have like the symbolism alone. Fighting, you know, like underground we can get fighting here. rings. They, okay. I think that your crew should be traveling with something illegal, something that is not legal in Rome. And that is one of those extra details that my brain would not have potentially thought of on its <laughs> own, which is another great reason to have critique groups that do this too. You know, everybody can just get together. So. And it is very early 20s and very oblivious uh, for somebody to be like, to, to consider it, it. It adds a sense of, oh, I think I'm invincible. Like, I can get away with breaking the law because I'm white and I'm wealthy and nothing bad ever happens to me. Uh, that's just a really good way to emphasize that attitude, maybe in both characters. So since we have the painter of Rome painting, mm -hmm. and since we have potentially that painter also being a beggar in another place, could, right now it's a man, could he also in another guise or in another place offer to sell a trinket or to say, if you could carry this for me, or if you could, <laughs> um, or to have somebody else say, I didn't bring my wallet, or, you know, can you just hold this while I go get something? And then they hold on to it, and the person doesn't come back, and that's a conversation. But really what they're doing is carrying something illegal that somebody else means to get. The problem I have with that idea, even though I was playing with it, is it's a short story. Mm -hmm. So anything that takes me too far away it's becomes be something else. Mm -hmm. I would have, um, I think a, a quick legal edge is going to be your fastest plot. Um, I would either have the third guys be somebody legal, like a cop. Um, I, I don't know what the version of that is in Rome, but um, I think somebody legal is an interesting way to look at it. Um, uh, or maybe these kids are there on a study abroad and this is like the person who's guiding them around, a tour guide. Um, the other option, probably the fastest, easiest one is a literal drug dealer. Well, something. that would be that would be a twist to the story. Absolutely. So it's just another way to who. test their personality. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, hmm. so. Different things to think about. This one's definitely a secondary card, secondary importance, work it in if you can. Okay. Um, these are gonna be the important things. You need to emphasize that the city is starving. And I would recommend you have some Everyone. compassion for the fact that the city is hungry. Because the more compassion you have for that, the more delicious details you're gonna be able to pull out of it. And the harder it's gonna hit when you have that moment where the friend is absorbed, but you, the friend also has the person who's left behind has like weird empathy for the city. Mm. Um, so that's going to be really important. Emphasize some of that history of who originally built the city and what is beautiful, genuinely beautiful about Rome. And then I think playing with something literally cloth would be interesting. An invitation to get the shirt off your back um, and or that friend being incorporated into beautiful details of the mm. city. A, beauti a beautiful detail that could also be cannibalistic, or it could be, okay, <laughs> again, my mind's just going in so many directions, it's fabulous. And fabulous. it might be something where the friend saw something that's falling apart and said, oh, isn't that a pity? Mm -hmm. And her death is what restores it. <sighs> it restores it, but it has to be definitely restored in a horrifying way to the one who witnesses it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's like two thirds, maybe it's like 20% of a painting where you can't tell what it's a mural of anymore. Mm -hmm. And I like that, that it, it does restore it, but it doesn't honor her friend in the meantime. So maybe like a picture of animals being forced to fight in gladiatorial Colosseum. Mm -hmm. um, Something that doesn't honor her. I love that idea that she serves a purpose, but the city does it in a way that's 
horrible and it needs to be as big and deep a horror as I can make it because Mm -hmm. that makes it cosmic if it's too understandable then it's not cosmic enough it's a good horror but is it a horror where it causes insanity I need to be as close to that as I can get you know Mm -hmm. Mm. and the elements sound like they're there I think it'd be fun. Um, if your friend is, or if uh, the, that character who gets absorbed, the veterinary Amy Lee. girl, Amy Lee. if she is super compassionate to animals, yes. there's one other detail of international travel that would be really easy to work in. Um, people will, um, and it's just like when you have animals in a zoo and they're not always taken good care of, but it's a tourist trap. So people will have animals as pets, like wild animals, monkeys, tigers and whatnot, elephants. And it's a tourist thing to like, oh, come see this exotic animal, but the animal's not treated well, the animal is like regularly sedated, or, you know, obviously not in a good, so you could, you could have some tourist opportunity for these friends to go look at, and the other friend is just like, that makes so no, much sense. Hard limit, can't do it. That makes so much sense. So, and that would be, that would be another great way to emphasize her love of animals, mm. and I think whatever it is that the city restores ought to be like a tragic ending of an animal. Mm. Well, that's fabulous. So Love it. And I, those are unique enough details. I've never seen anything quite like that. And I think you're going right. to see a lot. Of, I think your, author, your readers are going to see lots of character building and they're not going to see how it all strings together. Unless they watch this video. <laughs> Unless they watch this video. <laughs> then, then, like, it's all ruined for them. So... <laughs> But uh, there you go. So that is uh, how you tackle the ending to a short story. You have to nail, you have to know what your three layers are. You want to look for ways you can thematically build on them. And then I always, always try to give my monsters a purpose. Okay. Um, and yeah, that's tremendous. Thank you. Mm-hmm. This has been an amazing experience. It's got my mind going in so many Good. different directions right now. I mean, what we talked about, but also then my brain says, and this, and this, and this, and this. So who knows where it'll end, but it's, it's fabulous. Good luck. Thank I would love you to see so it much. It's done. I love Mithulu cards. Yes. <laughs> love them.